So we're going to talk a little bit about Sabbath this morning. Uh, it's something that I've been learning about. I know as a kid, I grew up like as a pastor's kid, where Sunday afternoon, usually we had to take naps and I wasn't allowed to ride my bike. And, you know, it was a pretty quiet day. We had to rest. And that was my introduction to Sabbath was a lot of rules. And it felt like, why can't I have fun? Like, can't go play outside. No, I've got to stay in my room and be quiet for an hour, which was miserable for a little kid. And then I grew up and had kids and realized my parents were brilliant. This was an amazing idea. We should all have naps on Sunday afternoon. But I can't convince my family to do that. Anyway, if this is a topic you want to learn more about, I have resources and I love sharing resources. Few people ever take me up on this offer, but I'm going to offer it again because I always love sharing resources. So Eugene Peterson, he's the guy who wrote the message translated the message version of the Bible, a pastor, teacher, author, brilliant guy. Um, he has this book called Christ Plays in 10,000 Places, A Conversation in Spiritual Theology. He has a chapter in there about Sabbath. Um, this one, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Some of you may have been familiar with this through small group studies. I saw it on the shelves when I came here. Um, Peter Scazzaro, um, he's got a chapter in here on Sabbath. It's really good. This one, The Spirit of the Disciplines by Dallas Willard. Dallas Willard is, um, this is considered a modern classic, a book about spiritual disciplines. It's amazing. I'd heard about it for years and years and finally read it about a year ago, and it's one of the best books I've ever read. He has a chapter about Sabbath. So these are not even books about Sabbath. These are ones where you can just read one chapter and get a little bit. So I'm going easy on you. This one is um, a book about Sabbath called by Abraham Heschel, who is a Jewish rabbi. So this one's from a Jewish um, perspective. And both uh, The Spirit of the Disciplines and um, The Sabbath by Heschel are books that other authors quote. Um, so I figured I should just read the ones they're all quoting. So those are available if you're interested in, and I have other stuff too about Sabbath, but those are a few where there's just a chapter if you just want to read a chapter. Um, those are, I always have stuff available. If you want to learn more, come talk to me and I can point you in directions. Um, I have an illustration to start the sermon, but before we get to that, let's just pray together. Jesus, um, we need your word to form us. And so we've heard your word read to us this morning, and now we're going to discuss it a little bit, or they're going to listen to me talk to them about, about my thoughts on your word. And so, God, I ask that you'd speak to our hearts this morning, that this just wouldn't be my ideas, but, Lord, that you would teach us something from what we've heard already or from something that I say, God, by your spirit, um, shape us by your word this morning, we pray. Amen. Go ahead. You can find so many of those online. Treadmill fails. Does life ever feel like you're on a treadmill? That's an obvious illustration, right? You guys knew where that one was going. It can be busy. It can be wearying. And we saw three different kind of treadmill experiences. The first one, the guy's just cruising and going faster and faster. The incline is getting higher. And we're all just waiting for him to wipe out. But he makes it. And then the second guy's like, well, if, if he can do it, I can do it, and jumps on. Bam! Do you ever experience that, where you see like somebody else's 
living so successfully and you think, well, I can do it if they can do it and we fall flat on our face. Or the second one, the woman who's trying so hard just to keep up and you see she's about to go down and then she does and the look of pain on her face. Like we've experienced that pain when we're just trying to keep up with life and we can't. And then the third one, we think we've got it handled. Something unexpected happens and throws us off. Life is hard sometimes. Sometimes we're, we feel like we're on this tre- treadmill, kind of trying to keep up. And the tendency when we're just trying to keep up is we can begin to neglect the important things. We heard Ben talk this morning about the five pillars of health. I'm sorry, I don't remember what all five of them were. Yeah, thank you. We can begin to neglect some of those areas of health, some of those things that are needed. And being healthy in all those kinds of ways, whether it's mental health, emotional health, physical health, spiritual health, what was the fifth one? Social. That was the one, social health. (laughs) All of those, if we want to be healthy in any of those areas, though, it requires effort. It requires time. It requires uh, some sort of discipline, some sort of practice that helps us to actually be healthy. In regarding to this treadmill kind of life, a guy named Wayne Mueller says, we've forgotten what enough feels like. We live in a world seduced by its own unlimited potential. So we're just going and going, chasing the next thing because it's unlimited potential. But Ruth Haley Barton, she's a... um, an author and a minister who runs a center for um, like spiritual contemplation and things like that. She, she wrote this poem, kind of getting at this idea. She says, Holy One, there's something I wanted to tell you, but there have been errands to run, bills to pay, arrangements to make, meetings to attend, friends to entertain, washing to do. And I forget what it is I wanted to say to you. And mostly I forget what I'm about or why. It's easy to lose ourselves in the crush of life. Just trying to run on that treadmill. And Jesus, in the scriptures we heard this morning, calls us to abide in him. And the Spirit wants to empower us to follow Jesus. To equip us and enable us to do this Christian life. To follow Jesus and abide and live this out in our neighborhoods and our families. And Jesus, in another scripture, talks about the easy yoke. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so often it doesn't feel that way. And so the question that I've asked through the years, often when I read these passages, is that sounds great, but how do I do it? What does it look like to abide in Christ? How do I root myself in him? How do I minister out of his strength and not my own? How do I... Let the Spirit empower me so that there's a divine power flowing through me. How do I take on an easy yoke when it feels like it's so hard all the time? Those are the questions that I've asked through the years, wondering, how, how do I do this? And more and more what I'm learning and recognizing is that Christianity, following Jesus, is something that we do. It's not just a belief system. It's something that's practiced, that's lived out in everyday life. And so I want to invite us this morning to think about Sabbath as a practice, as something that we do that enables us to to live this easy yoke, abiding in Jesus, empowered by the Spirit kind of life. It's a practice that we're invited into that forms us and shapes us to be people who are deeply connected to Jesus to ourselves, to one another, to emotional, spiritual, physical, social, mental. Did I get them all? To health. Sabbath is a rhythm of abiding. Abiding in Jesus. So we heard a few different scriptures this morning. We heard the creation story where um, God rests after creating heavens and the earth. We heard the Ten Commandments where Sabbath is commanded as one of the commandments and it points back to the creation story as the rationale for it. Because God rested on the seventh day, you also need to rest. 
We heard Jesus talking about abiding in him. And we're invited into Sabbath as a way of abiding. And so I want to point us to four verbs that are present in that creation story in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. It says, God finished the work of creating the heavens and the earth. He rested from his work. He blessed the day and he hallowed it or he made it holy. So there's four verbs in that verse. So those are going to be kind of the the main points of my sermon this morning. As we think about Sabbath, as I teach about Sabbath, um, those four verbs get at kind of some of the essential things about Sabbath that are really beautiful. And I was telling Karen, this is really four sermons packed into one because each one of these verbs could be its own thing. Um, But I don't have time for that. So I'm just going to take all the time we have this morning. I'm kidding. I'll go through quick. So the first verb is God finished. God finished. And the idea here is that Sabbath is a discipline. It's something that we do that requires effort and planning and discipline. And the idea of disciplines, disciplines are something that give us access to power and freedom. And so last week I talked about the illustration of me learning how to run and, and how at first it's so hard, but eventually as you push your, your body, you get to the point where you're able to run further, farther, faster. There's a freedom that can come through the discipline of running regularly, but it has to be disciplined. It doesn't, you don't access that power and that freedom to run further, farther, faster if your running is haphazard. If you run tomorrow and then another week from now you run again and then in a month you run again and no it happens when you're disciplined about it when you run daily or every other day when it's often and frequent enough that you can begin to access the power that comes through that and the freedom that comes from that i experienced the similar kind of thing making coffee at starbucks where i have i had to learn all these new formulas for all the different drinks that they make and there's so much to retain and to remember, but at the same time, we're supposed to be connecting with customers and not just head down focused on making the drink right. And over time, you begin to gain muscle memory where the repeated actions that you're doing every day after day begin to be something that you just know how to do. You don't have to think about it so much. You don't have to remember how many pumps of that syrup or how many shots of coffee go in that drink or how much milk do I need. You just do it and you can have the freedom now to talk with the customers, to be present with the people that are standing in front of you and engage on a whole nother level. There's a power and a freedom that come through discipline. So Dallas Willard in that book, Spirit of the Disciplines that I pointed out to you, says the disciplines are activities of mind and body purposefully undertaken to bring our personality and our total being into effective cooperation with the divine order. He's talking now about spiritual disciplines. They enable us more and more to live in a power that is, strictly speaking, beyond us, deriving from the spiritual realm itself. So if we think about discipline as something that gives us access to power and freedom, spiritual disciplines then do that on a spiritual level. They enable us to be available for what the Spirit wants to do in us so that we can begin to access the power and the freedom that God wants to give us. And so Sabbath is something that we do that helps us abide with Jesus and thereby access the power that the Holy Spirit wants to give us to live the way of Jesus. Abraham Heschel, in the other book I pointed out to you, he's the Jewish rabbi. He says, labor is a craft, but perfect rest is an art. It's the result of an accord of body, mind, and imagination. To attain the degree, a degree of excellence in art, one must accept its discipline. One must adjure slothfulness. The seventh day is a palace in time which we build. It's made of soul, of joy, and reticence. In its atmosphere, a discipline is a reminder of adjacency to eternity. Indeed, the splendor of the day is expressed in terms of abstentions, meaning we abstain from things. How else express glory in the presence of eternity if not by the silence of abstaining from noisy acts? Peter Scazzaro in the chapter in Emotionally Healthy Spirituality says, the first principle of Sabbath is stop. 
And the, the actual word for Sabbath, he reminds us, is derived from a Hebrew word for, that means ceasing, to stop your activity, ceasing from our work so that we can delight in God. So Sabbath is a day that we stop working. And we engage in ceasing, in resting, in worship, in delighting in God. It requires discipline. It requires guidelines, rules, or, or hedges that help us know what stopping looks like. So one person that I've heard about has their family put all their digital devices in a basket and they put it in the closet for their Sabbath day. They take a break from their digital devices. That's one of their family rules, one of their hedges that guides their Sabbath practice. Others refuse to engage in the systems of the marketplace and they decide not to buy anything on the Sabbath. There's all kinds of ways that you can create guidelines that help you cease to stop and engage with the day. And those are rules not for being legalistic about it, but to help guide our practice, to help shape our practice into something that can stay focused and purposeful. But it's important that we stay away from turning it into legalism. Paul reminds the Colossians, he says, don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. And even within the church, there's a variety of practice around Sabbath. The Sabbath day, the seventh day in the Hebrew tradition is a Saturday. Sunday, the Lord's Day, is the first day of the week. And in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, the Eastern side of the church, they tend to celebrate Sabbath on Saturday. Where in the West, they've tended to move toward the Lord's Day. And the Sunday has been the day of Sabbath, or ceasing, or resting. St. Ignatius, an early um, bishop, I think, in the church, talked about this transition that was made from the Sabbath as a Saturday to the Lord's Day. And he refers to the Sabbath as, or to the Lord's Day as the Queen of Days, which is an interesting phrase because when I was reading um, the Jewish guy, he talks about the Sabbath as the Queen of Days. And so Ignatius illustrates the transition. So he says, Let us therefore no longer keep the Sabbath after the Jewish manner and rejoice in days of idleness. But let every one of you keep the Sabbath after a spiritual manner, rejoicing in meditation on the law, not in relaxation of the body admiring the workmanship of God and not eating things prepared the day before, nor using lukewarm drinks or walking within a prescribed space, nor finding delight in dancing and plaudits which have no sense in them. And after the observance of the Sabbath, let every friend of Christ keep the Lord's Day as a festival, the resurrection day, the queen and chief of all the days. And so he's rejecting some of the the guidelines, the rules that the Jewish tradition had put around the Sabbath and advocating instead for a Christian observance um, that focuses more on a spiritual understanding of it, which is interesting. But at the same time, he's still advocating keeping the Sabbath. He's just saying, let's reframe it a little bit. So what I'm advocating for us as we talk about a year of Sabbath and in your bulletin, there's an insert um, where I'm inviting you into two habits through this year. The first being a daily quiet time. The second being a weekly Sabbath day. And so this is not something rigid or legalistic. I'm not going to be checking up on you to see if you're doing it or not. We're not interested in making laws. We're interested in inviting you into something that has the ability to give life to help us abide in Jesus and experience the fullness of the power and the freedom that God wants to give us. And one of the practices that I think has potential to shape us in really powerful ways is the practice of the Sabbath. And it doesn't shape us if we don't do it, which means we have to move beyond thinking about it as a good idea and actually practicing it as a day of the week that we stop working and engage in Sabbath. So let's not be rigid about it, but recognize that practicing it takes time and effort. It's a discipline. And it's a discipline for abiding in Jesus. So that's the first verb, is that God 
finished his work. The second verb is that God rested. And the idea here is that Sabbath is a delight. It's something delightful. It's not a, 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 a nasty law that's been opposed on us imposed on us that we just have to do like that was my experience as a kid right i have to sit in my room for an hour not doing anything that's not what sabbath is meant to be it's meant to be a delight something that brings freedom and joy and that's what disciplines do ultimately is they bring freedom and joy in our lives dallas willard talks about this kind of freedom when he says that the the mark of a disciplined person is that they have the ability to do what needs to be done when it needs to be done so if you need to run a marathon, you can't do that if you haven't had the discipline in place to prepare you to do it. But then when you reach that point, the mark of a disciplined person, they can do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. They've prepared themselves for that occasion. So according to the creation story in Genesis 1 and 2 and the commandment in Exodus 20, um, God rested on the seventh day. And then the commandment is given. One of the Ten Commandments, the Big Ten, is for us to do the same, for us to be like God and rest one day a week. We are not machines who are just meant to work constantly. We emulate God and His example. But at the same time, we recognize that God didn't rest because He was tired. He didn't rest because He was worn out after His work of creation. No, his rest on the seventh day was time set aside to delight in what he had done. He finished his work and now he took time to enjoy it. It's interesting to note that Adam's first day, Adam was created on the sixth day according to the story, and then his first full day as a human being was the seventh day. The first full day that Adam experienced was the day when God rested. So Adam's life begins out of this place of rest with God. He didn't run straight into his work. No, the work came. God gave him work to do, keep the garden, tend it, be fruitful and multiply. The work was there, but the first thing Adam was called to do, the first thing he was invited into was a day of rest with God. So there's a rhythm here. There's a rhythm that's essential to creation, that's built into our world of resting and working. The Hebrew day is described, there was evening and there was morning. The first day, there was evening and there was morning. The second day, the Hebrew day traditionally begins at sundown, the evening before. You begin a Hebrew day by going to bed. And then out of the rest that comes, through the night, the, the rejuvenation in your body and your soul and your spirit that comes from sleeping, being with God in that time, then you engage your day. Then you go to work. We rest in order to work. We don't rest from our work. Lance Witt writes that we live in a universe defined by rhythm. As you inhale and exhale, exhale, your breathing has rhythm. Your heart beats in rhythm. You have brain waves that move in rhythm. The seasons of the year are all about rhythms. Farming has a rhythm of planting, growing, harvesting. The ocean waves has rhythm as the tide comes in and goes out. Even building muscle is marked by the rhythm of workout and recovery. We begin by resting in God and then out of that rest, we're sent to work in the world. And then we come back and we rest in God and then we're sent to work in the world and we come back and rest and we're sent to our work. There's a rhythm to our lives that we're invited into. Eugene Peterson cautions us not to make Sabbath all about us at the same time. It's not just that we rest in order to work better. He says, no, we're interested in God and Christ being formed in us. And Sabbath is not primarily about us or how it benefits us, although it does benefit us. But that's not its main purpose, but it's about God and how God forms us. So Heschel describes in his Jewish perspective the Sabbath as a day of rest, as a day of abstaining from toil, is not for the purpose of recovering one's lost strength and becoming fit for the forthcoming labor. He says the Sabbath is a day for the sake of life. 
It is not an interlude, but the climax of living. To observe the Sabbath is to celebrate the coronation of a day in the spiritual wonderland of time. Call the Sabbath a delight, a delight to the soul and a delight to the body. And he says it's not dedicated exclusively to spiritual goals. That's our temptation sometimes as Christians is to over-spiritualize it. But this is something that's physical as well. So he says, comfort and pleasure are an integral part of the Sabbath observance. Man in his entirety, all his faculties must share its blessing. So we, in order to be healthy, need not just be spiritually healthy, but emotionally, mentally, physically, socially. There's all kinds of aspects of health that are needed in our lives. And Sabbath helps us engage in all of those. Peter Scazzaro points to the principles of rest and delight as principles two and three that he gives of Sabbath keeping. We stop, but then we rest and we delight in the day. So take times to do things that are refreshing, do things that are delightful. So one person on the evening that the Sabbath begins and to mark the tradition with his family is following the Jewish pattern of, of beginning the day and the evening before. Um, So with his family, he bakes a giant cookie in a skillet and then dumps a whole tub of ice cream on the top and they all dig in and that's how they start their Sabbath day. How delightful is that? Other people take a nap. How many times in our busy lives do we get a chance to just take a nap? Some of us, after a lifetime of work, now you have the time to take a nap. (laughs) Or enjoy a walk. Delight in spending time with friends or play. Play a sport, play games, dance. I hear people referring to Sabbath as their favorite day of the week, something that they look forward to. It's meant to be a day of delight as we delight in abiding with Jesus. So God was the first verb. He finished. Sabbath is a discipline, and God rested. Sabbath is a delight. Third, God blessed the day. The Sabbath is a blessing. There are three things that are blessed in the creation story. The animals are blessed to reproduce. The humans are blessed to reproduce and flourish. And the Sabbath day is blessed. The Sabbath day is a day that's been blessed with the ability to give life to procreate. So Abraham Heschel describes the the Sabbath day as a palace in time, a day that's for the sake of life. He he describes how the ancient rabbis puzzled over a phrase in Genesis 2-2 that talks about God finishing on the seventh day. I think in the NIV it says, by the seventh day he finished his work, but Heschel was pointing to it, saying on the seventh day he finished his work, and the rabbis puzzling over this, like, He worked, in in Exodus it says that he he created the heavens and earth in six days, and then on the seventh he rested. But in Genesis, he's saying the rabbis are debating over, well, why does it say the seventh day he finished? And so they they say that the ancient rabbis conclude there must have been an act of creation on the seventh day. And just as heaven and earth were created in six days, menucha was created on the Sabbath. And this is a word that we usually um, translate as rest, but it means here, they say, much more than withdrawal from labor. It's a word that's not just a negative concept, but it's something real and intrinsically positive. So to the biblical mind, he writes, menucha is the same as happiness, as stillness, as peace and harmony. It's the essence of good life. So we read in Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Those are the still waters, or the waters of Menuhat. The root there is the same word. In later times, even this word became a synonym for life in the world to come, for eternal life. So I love that picture of the rabbis debating over, well, what, is, what did God do on the seventh day? He created rest. That was the day that he gave us the gift of a day that can bring us life, that can bless us in a, in a way that nothing else can. So he describes the day as a palace in time, as a place in time that we meet God. 
and we are refreshed and restored. Eugene Peterson talks about the Sabbath being about creation completed in resurrection. And as Christians, we can take this even deeper, knowing that in Jesus, God is restoring all of creation. That we're invited into a resurrection life where all the dead things are made alive again, where the old is made new. And so we're invited into a practice that forms our souls and our bodies as the resurrection of Jesus continues to renew us and restore us and remake us. Sabbath is the blessing of new life as we abide in Jesus. So God finished, God rested, God blessed it, and then God hallowed the day. He made it holy. The Sabbath is a holy day. It's a day for connecting with God. It's a day that's set aside as holy. A holy means other, separate, unique. It's a palace in time where we get to meet with the living God. We don't have to go to a place to meet God. He's not found in space somewhere. We encounter God in time. And the Sabbath is a day, a time set aside for us to meet God in a unique kind of way. One author notes how significant it is that the very first thing that God makes holy in all of creation, the first time this word appears in the Bible, it's not any object in space, it's not a mountain or an altar or any kind of place or thing, but it's a day, holiness in time. And even the way that the Sabbath is organized, it follows no logic that's inherent in any kind of calendar system, like those based on lunar or solar cycles, Our calendar is a solar calendar, so our months are all based on how long it takes uh, for the sun to revolve around the year, and it gets divided up. And and there's lunar calendars. The Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar, so a month is the time between the, the waxing and the waning of the moon. I might not be getting the terms exactly right, but it's all connected to the solar system and what's happening. It's observable, markable, measurable. The Sabbath doesn't follow any of that logic. A seven-day cycle, where does that come from? It doesn't make any sense in any kind of physical way in our universe. It's a gift to us. A holy day. A day set aside for us to encounter God in time. It's not a day that's bound to space. But in the holiness of time, we're invited to intentionally and regularly be with God as a rhythm of our lives. One of Peter Scazzaro's principles for Sabbath is contemplation. And in our Sabbath year proposal, we talk about worship and pray, prayer, as some rhythms for us to engage this year around Sabbath. It's a day for us to connect with God in a way like nothing else. When we regularly, as a rhythm of our lives, Not just of resting, but also of worshiping, of contemplating God, of being with God in prayer. It shapes us, it forms us, it blesses us. It's a holy day, a palace in time. Eugene Peterson says, I don't see any way out of it. If we are going to live appropriately in the creation, we must keep the Sabbath. We must stop running around long enough to see what he has done, meaning God, what God has done and is doing. We must shut up long enough to hear what God has said and is saying. All of our ancestors agree that without silence and stillness, there is no spirituality, no God-attentive, God-responsive life. Sabbath is the holiness of time spent abiding with Jesus. So that's the invitation for us today. Sabbath is a discipline, it's a delight, it's a blessing, and it's a holy day. It's an ancient way for us to abide in Jesus, to do what Jesus did so that we can be renewed and remade to be like Jesus. And so I invite you to practice Sabbath this year. If it's not something you've already been practicing, then to make it a part of your schedule. Figure it out. Find a time that works. Sunday makes sense for a lot of people. Uh, for me, I'm, we're, our family's wrestling with that because Sunday, I'm usually exhausted after church. I've done all my extrovert stuff and the introvert needs to just 
take a nap or something. And so the rest of the day is sort of a write-off. Um, so we're toying with Saturday being our Sabbath. Some of you maybe work shift work or something and like figure it out. But make a day that's a regular part of your rhythm that you spend time engaging in these kinds of practices and see what kind of life God might bring to us as we do this. So it's an invitation, not a command, from me at least. It's an invitation because I think God has given this to us as a gift. Pick a day, set some guidelines. That's the discipline part of it. Enjoy the day. That's the, the delight. And be renewed, be blessed as you contemplate and worship God on this holy day. Father, help us with this, we pray. Thank you for this gift. Amen.